This is the Demystifying Mental Toughness Podcast, hosted by David Charlton, and you're listening to this podcast to help you build your own mental toughness, or so that you can support other people or your clients better. Either way, you will learn more about developing this plastic personality trait that all but guarantees that you will perform better and lead a more prosperous life. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you're listening to episode 138 of the Demystifying Mental Toughness podcast. Today, we talk about an important topic, sleep. Yes, it's something that we all do. Some enjoy it more than others, and they struggle to get out of bed. Some burn the candle at both ends and don't get enough sleep. Yet, some go on to find life stressors and pressures, mean that they have internal battles, which actually goes on to impact their sleep quality too. And when you consider mental toughness and sleep, it's easy to think that the mentally tough won't need so much sleep, that they can grind it out, that they can push through fatigue. And this may be partially true. However, sleep is essential for the mentally tough too. You know, being committed to your goals, taking challenges head on, and then dealing with pressure, it requires a clear head, focus, and perspective. So Nick Littlehills, a well-respected sleep coach to many elite sports performers, goes on to share more on this topic, where he tells you about his experiences supporting Manchester United and Arsenal football clubs, staff and players. He also goes on to touch on other sports and the intricacies that need to be considered when we're talking about all things sleep and recovery. Nick also chats about what he believes are the seven key sleep recovery indicators and shares some tips for parents to enjoy. Hi Nick, it's it's great to have you on the show. Um, A big thank you. Are you able to share with the listeners your background and your your interest in sleep? It's great to be with you today, David. Um, That's a long old story. I've been telling it for quite a long time um, over the last few years because of a book that got published and all sorts of things. But in general terms, I uh, I fell into the world of sleep. I, it wasn't a purposeful decision. Um, I loved sports as a teenager. That was my drive. Um, but I ended up getting married. I fell into a family business. Um, and that led me to being an international sales and marketing director of a very big sleeping comfort group, which, if you're old enough, um, was called Slumberland. And that led me to all sorts of things, traveling around the world, looking at sleep, looking at products, looking at all sorts of things. And I think along that route, um, I was faced with that all the clinical experts I'd ever come across in sleep. Um, the fact we didn't even have a sleep council in the UK, you know, a body to represent sleep. So we put that together and I was chairman of that for a, a while. I think it was just always taken for granted. It was never a performance criteria. I heard so many times how important it was to us as human beings. It was a health pillar that was sort of shoved on the end of the other three. And um, I suppose just became a little bit disillusioned with that because there was no definitive approach. It's sort of like, get your eight hours and I'll see you tomorrow. Um, So I sort of decided I was going to go off and do something different in my mid-40s. Uh, my UK office was was based in Oldham, Manchester, uh, in the northeast, northwest, however you want to put it. Um, so I was literally wandering off to do something else. And um, I bumped into the world of sport through the local football club called Manchester United. Uh, the manager was Alex Ferguson. Um, I sponsored the local football team, Oldham Athletic, sponsoring their shirts. So that led me to go along to a few things. And strangely enough, you know, over a glass of wine or something like that, um, we sort of opened up that opportunity of, you know, what is sleep and recovery? So probably any other manager, any other football club on the planet, that conversation would have ended um, after a cool glass of Pinot Grigio or whatever it was. But he was in those very early stages of being extremely fascinated by the other side of sport. Um the human side of sports. And I suppose it was, you know, what do we do? What, how do we even advise or look after the players at that time uh, when they're away from us as a club? 
So that just led to me getting involved with the club um, and exploring my, you know, myths and misunderstandings about sleep and trying to redefine their approach to recovery. And uh, here we are 24 years later. Fantastic. Uh, that's a great story, that is. So in terms of... That was the short version, David. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not, you know, uh, it's sort of, uh, yeah. In terms of how you, well, went about the, the work there with Manchester United, is it on a one-to-one basis? Would it be in groups? How did you, I can imagine with, I don't know, the egos of footballers and um, the... I don't know. I don't know. Would sleep be seen as a soft thing, or yeah? You tell tell me a little bit more. I I don't think sleep had any perception whatsoever than something you just do when there's nothing left better to do. Um, there was there was no sports science back then. Talking late late nineties, um, lots of us have only just got phones and you know and texts and things like that. Um, so there was. Very little data collection. There was no sports science. There weren't psychologists. Um, so it was a very sort of weird area to be even looking at. So I wasn't, um, you know, a sleep coach. Um, I was just a guy working for a company who had an interest in sport and also had an interest in this crazy health pillar. So it was literally just having conversations. So Initially, it was with the physio, a guy called Dave Fever, who was constantly rehabilitating a player. And then every time they jumped in their Ferrari and went home and slept and they came back, the same things were there. So it was kind of like, could you, you know, maybe help and advise them privately? Um, So it was little things like that. It was sort of, well, maybe when the players are in training, you could be up in the players' lounge and We'll invite anybody to come and have a chat to you about mattresses or pillows or anything else you want to talk to them about, Nick, because we have made a significant change with this one player, so maybe others would be interested. Um, Only one player came to see me back then, you know, in the players' lounge. Um, But then we started to – there was a significant shift, which was – um, Alex at the time decided to double up pre-season training, which had never been done before. And that meant they trained in the morning and in the afternoon. And that was quite a significant shift, uh, which took a, a bit of a challenge to for the players and the coaches and everybody else. So what it created was a, a space between morning training and afternoon training. What do we do with them? So I actually thought, well, let's create a recovery room. Let's encourage them to have this nap thing. Um, because I was aware of polyphasic sleeping. I was also aware of chronotypes. And so I thought, well, if we can get them to do some recovery rather than just hanging around after lunch, um, that will help benefit them in the afternoon. So it was a little journey like that, David. It was like, okay, so we're now doing pre-season, double up pre-season. Track. So let's create a recovery room, um, a nap room, uh, you know, to help with that. Then we started looking at, well, I could spot that, you know, there's an owl and a lark and there's a chronotype here and a chronotype there. So suddenly the data that was being collected was different in the morning to the afternoon. And so we're correlating that with, hang on a minute, you know, the PMers, the night timers, and the, well, that's interesting. Maybe we could reflect that on. <clears throat> and it was literally just a journey of that, you know, just, why don't you look at that? Why can't we consider that? And one of the other sort of factors was because I was aware of polyphasic sleeping rather than monophasic sleeping, which is just one block out, eight hour culture that we have now. And that, right, very early, not that long ago, we would never try and sleep in one block. There's no evidence of that whatsoever. It was only electric light bulb time, 30s, when we started to shift that. So I thought, well, with all the multi-schedules and all the games and all the things and everybody involved, and some have got children and some haven't, and that sort of thing within the coaches and the manager and everybody else, as a collective organisation, maybe we should be a little bit more focused on circadian rhythms as human beings, how we're synchronised that process, light, dark, and temperature shifts. Maybe we should be a little bit more focused on our ability to recover in a polyphasic way well in one block. That would certainly help uh, with the random approach to the 24 hours. 
And uh, that's really just that journey that started to develop. And um, a lot of those players, you know, I'm an Aston Villa fan, so I had no relationship with Manchester United or anybody else like that. But it was sport. It was elite athletes, but a very young group. That influenced the England squad because they played for the England squad again. So I ended up working with Arsenal Football Club because there was a relationship with the England squad and Arsenal Football Club through the physio Gary Lewin. That led me to the Euro 2004 Championships, where we took it a little further and started looking at the environment and the products they were sleeping on and their individual profiles. And then that shifted again into British cycling in around 2008-9, where they were challenged to put a British rider on the Tour de France podium within five years, as well as making cycling uh, far more prominent in uh, in the UK. And, and I was involved with that uh, collection of coaches led by Sir now Sir Dave Brailsford. And the whole process of that was the aggregation of marginal gains. And that means absolutely everything you look at and see if you can make a tiny little bit of an impression in a positive manner. So it aggregates up. And that then culminated in 2012, London Olympics, when they continued to smash gold medals, gold records um, on the track in the velodromes and time trials and the Tour de France was when, you know, now Sir Bradley Wiggins was the first yellow judge. And they've been doing that for fun since then. So it, it kind of, rather than me sort of deciding I was going to be a sports sleep coach, it was sort of suddenly the media realized that I was working with footballers. I was talking about sleep. They put coach and sleep together and go, they've got a sleep coach. And nobody had any idea about what I was doing, you know, tucking them in, reading bedtime stories, that sort of stuff. So it's a really sort of jokey, tongue in cheek sleep. That just happens. So, you know, where we're talking today, it's just uh, an enormous shift over a few decades couple of decades to our relationship with that now and in all sorts of areas too. Just going back to a couple of things you said there, you, you mentioned there about the jokey element to, to sleep and you talked about data. I'd imagine the data was like very important as a, I suppose, as a bit of a selling tool moving forward for you to actually show that there are benefits in, in what you do. Um, well, I say that, that, you know, we weren't, we were not wandering around with trackers Um there was a, is very limited in those stages. That's obviously developed over time. But I think, you know, every time there is a, a great danger, I think. And, and, you know, in elite sport, if you can't track it and create the data, you don't do it uh, to be able to measure it. But there's also been a sort of shift to lots of tracking, um, to a shift to only looking at specific types of data because it can be extremely intrusive. And it can have all sorts of counterproductive side effects if you don't manage it carefully. So I think it's really interesting that we already have a medical term for the increased anxiety and stress uh, that's caused to people who track their sleep called orthosomnia. Do you want to just talk a little bit more about that? It's something new to you. It's, um, I think principally, you know, I'm not a non-tech person. I, I might be a certain age um, who's lived his life through you know, non-tech, non-24 hours, and and here we are today. But it's it's kind of, if you've got a health pillar called sleep, um, where we know so much about nutrition and hydration and uh, fueling up and all of that stuff, we've been doing it to death. And we know so much about it at all levels through the population, not just at the top. You know, get your five a day, exercise 30 minutes at the basic levels right the way through. And the, the sort of trackers can really help you um, understand what's going on while you're training, while you're performing, while you're interacting with your day to give you a really good understanding. But you already have a good understanding, so you can, you can read it, okay? So, but with absolutely no education in schooling, you know, I've been coaching doctors and surgeons and medics and all sorts of people because... They have very little, it really is a sort of taken for granted type health pillar. It's not a performance criteria, although it's classed as being really important. So if you go from no education, parents not passing it on, 
nobody taking it through their formative growth years into adulthood and beyond. It, they just create a random approach of just hoping that they can sleep when there's nothing better to do. They get given things like get your eight hours. If you only get six, you're going to pass away or get Alzheimer's when you're old or all the other things. Um if you eat too late or you don't have a consistent wait time or you your bedroom is not 16 to 18 degrees, you just go, hang on a minute. I, I don't meet many people around the world, you know, when we look at our planet, who can even adopt this, right? So they tend to ignore it and just create their own way of, you know, living and recovering. But they have no idea of some of the key factors. So if you jump from that, straight into putting a track in and opening up the sleep element of it and then suddenly being getting told you've only got so much deep sleep <clears throat> or so many awakenings or you, you've only got 6.25 hours. And you're also looking at data being created by something that's a bit guessworky. You know, it's it's really good these days, but it's not that specific. So it's kind of, is it reflective of... Yeah how you actually felt. So sleep has always been driven by, David, did you get a good night's sleep last night? And did you sleep okay? And how many hours did you try and get? And you'll go, eight, I'm okay. It was a bit disturbed, but I'm fine. Let's crack on. So you take that mindset and suddenly start tracking it. You wake up in the morning and you feel pretty good, right? Not great, but pretty good, you know, to crack on with your day. Yeah. But the data is telling you that you're failing against what criteria, you know? So I was always interested. So that's why it, it does in create anxiety because you'll, you'll look at this data and you need to look at this data through the seasons of the year over a, quite a number of years, right, like we do with everything else. You want to look at that data when you're ill, when you're on your day off, when you do things outside of the norm, like having a party or a birthday party or traveling, and your your partner might be ill and you're dealing with a concert in a flat, in the countryside, in a hotel, you have to start creating a much broader level of data to then understand correlated to your awareness of the key factors. And when you bring those two things together, you've got a reasonable chance of going, well, if I do this, that's likely to be the consequence. Mm -hmm. Whereas before, we didn't care about what we did from the point of way throughout our day. We just go on and get on with it. You know, we eat this, we do that, we da, da, da. We just crack on and then we just go, you know, there's only eight hours left before i got to do it again. I better get some rest. So it's that shift of just some suddenly being able to jump into something. But I think that's reflective of everything we're faced with in this wonderful 24-7 technological, technological world that we live in. It is amazing and scary with the same dollops, you know? Yeah, I, I agree so, so much. It's it's so important to, to know exactly what it is that you're looking at and try and simplify it. And I see lots of athletes um Obviously, with, with statistics in different sports now, how they're thrown in their face. And, well, you know, suddenly, suddenly I'm, you know, you're coaching in a certain way where nobody knows about anything. Then suddenly I start getting, you know, contacts from, from clients going, Nick, you know, I woke up this morning and, and my data says I really slept badly. I feel okay, but I've got a training session in an hour. What can I do? <laughs> and I go, Let's just go, where are you getting this data from? Well, I got a tracker or a ring or a something. I bought it online last weekend and it arrived and I started using it. Why didn't you tell me you were doing that? Why didn't we go through this process together? In that, Because you just were sat there in front of your device and went, oh, look, there's a fancy thing. And you just ordered it, bang, in it comes, boom. What else are you doing? Oh, I'm taking melatonin supplements. I've got eye masks. I've got blue blocker glasses. What? Whoa, slow down. You know, slow down. Yeah. You, you used to be an ex-professional golfer, didn't you? Is that well, loosely. You know, I I, uh, I love sport at school. Um, I'm not 
you know, unintelligent or non-academic. It's just it's sport got in the way. I'd much rather be out there trying to be a sports, but but I ended up doing a period of about five years when I um, was an assistant golf professional at a local golf club, which is a very unique golf club at the time. But um, yeah, I went through the sort of professional golf associations thing to become a qualified professional, but I had to work too hard at my game. It wasn't completely natural. Mm -hmm. So um, back in those days, I mean, back in those days, I mean, David, this was the late 70s, early 80s, you know? Okay, yeah. It's not easy to get into sport. I'm thinking about it from this this whole data angle with with golf. You know, you can track your driving, your putting stats. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And all of that. And I see so many golfers who are looking at the wrong stats and it affects their confidence. Again, anxiety comes into it. That's exactly it. What I mentioned about it, it, you know, we love to collect the data and to measure. We have to, but it's what bit because there's just too much, and uh, yeah. and that's a really key factor as to yeah is to making those things work. I think I suppose as well. You when you look at other sports and video analysis, how if someone is just solely focusing on the negative size, again, that has an impact. So the whole delivery and the training around that is so important. But let's... let's yeah, keep... I mean, I remember a few occasions, um, you know, it, we, we were, we're all very aware um, that you can not sleep at all. You can sleep really badly. You can spend most of the time you've allocated to sleep awake, and stressed because there's something really important happening tomorrow, like an exam or a a child is being born or something's happening. You know, it's an interview for a job. It's an Olympic final. And we all know that we can actually deal with that and still go out and smash it. So it's kind of, it was kind of like, can we actually use not sleeping as a performance criteria? in the right moments, in the right time, and focus our attention on something else, recovery orientated, that maybe is not. So trying to sleep before a major event usually would be forcing yourself to sleep. And forcing yourself to sleep can be very counterproductive. And if you're not careful, can turn into, you know, lots of sleeping tablets and all sorts of things, trying to manage that. But if you sort of go, if I've got, if I've got a technique that sort of takes advantage of that. So Steve Redgrave, so Steve Redgrave, um, most people listening to this would know of him, wouldn't even try to sleep the night before a, a particular trial or inside of the Olympic because the adrenaline, the cortisol, the anxiety, the stress, will this be the last one? Will I get another gold medal? All of that stuff's going on. So trying to go into a sleep state, you're going to have to force yourself. So maybe you can look at other types of recovery techniques that still allows you to get to that particular point. You can't do it endlessly, but in certain moments, in certain times, you can use that knowledge to be able to get you to that place in a much better place than trying to force yourself to sleep. So what would those other types of recovery look like? What what would they be? Well, it could be easy just like sitting there and and watching, you know, uh, footage of when you, you know, were really successful. You know, in a past event, look at me winning a gold medal. Look at me, you know, I felt really tired halfway up that, you know, that regatta. I was really, but I pushed through and we were able to win a gold. So Chris Hoy would look at things where he's winning a, he, on the track, he's winning something by the by the slimmest, slimmest little wheel of his bike right at the end of something. So it was kind of like thinking about, you know, there's all those things like meditation, mindfulness, binaural beats, and all that sort of stuff. But it was basically just creating, being able to create on the journey up to that particular point is that you had a technique that allowed you to start slowly adapting, getting your recovery in other areas of the 24 hours, so that when you came to that particular place, it was all focused on your personal performance rather than did you sleep well last night. And you can use that to create those examples away from a major event and just say, right, now we'll look at the next month. We'll create a particular event that's going to happen there. 
So what we'll do is we'll think polyphasically, because um, I have a technique about that. We'll use that process to adjust how we go into it and come out of it. So it was. It's really sort of important to the the one thing I've always learned, and I think still stands today. And as we said before about author insomnia and tech, worrying about sleep is its biggest disruptor. At whatever level it is, you know, will I sleep tonight? How will I feel in the morning? Will I get my eight hours? How many awakenings will I have? You know, we start to to worry about that aspect, um, like we do with other things. But worrying about sleep is is something you and your brain really want to get over pretty quick because it's a really natural process. You can reveal it very, very easily, but you just have to have some knowledge and awareness of the key factors. That's fascinating. Um, I'm just thinking back to some conversations I've had before. When I, uh-huh. I, was, I was telling you a little bit earlier, my, my kids are, are, are pretty young. They're, they're, they're four and seven, and neither of them slept. Good luck to you, Dave. <laughs> 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 Have you got through the hard part yet? I can tell you now as a grandparent, it never stops. <laughs> that was that was what I was going to get to. So the, the really hard part was the for about a five year period, we sleep was not was not good at all. No. Um, and I, I became the king of the cat naps. Yeah, yeah. I, I used to get so many negative comments about about napping um, and how you know you shouldn't be doing that and blah blah blah. Do you, you know, do you come across that as much in your work? Oh, came across it all the time. You know, I wasn't, uh, you know, I wasn't Googling it in those days. I had to go down the library, you know, a couple of decades ago and find these things out or talk to professionals. Um, so I became very aware of polyphasic sleeping. So we sleep three times a day, twice a day, multiphasically. And so, oh, the, how did that work? Well, it was a different perception of sleep. This was recovery in every 24 hours some of it's nocturnal in a full sleep state some of it is is just vacant mind space stuff you know sitting on a bench by a river and just drifting uh being outside in the mountains going camping um it was sort of like yeah like meditation it's just you're not really trying to sleep but we can fall asleep behind the wheel of a car on a motorway that's nuts uh, we sort of pass out on trains and planes and things like that and on the sofa. And it normally happens around these particular points, like midday, late afternoon, in a triphasic way. So you could, but the problem was, as soon as you, then it was very proactive, right? Because we were synchronized with sunrise, midday, sunset, 24 hours, right? We, we were far more synchronized with our own internal circadian rhythms, our own internal clock and the external clock and definitely our relationship with light, okay? So as soon as you start shoving that all into one block nocturnally to get all of your recovery in one space, it's like sleep's a waste of time. And as soon as you start doing that, what you then put yourself under enormous amount of pressure is whether it works for you or it doesn't work. So during that period, you got... You've got, we, we were always taking some recovery like siesta midday, right? It's the graveyard slot in business just after lunch where you disappear in the room, but you're still conscious. We're all aware of these things. So it was kind of what happened was that that shifted from being a very positive recovery, you know, approach to 24 hours as human beings. It then became, we just sleep at night. So there's snoozers for losers, there's napping, um, all became very negative. And we have a another one today, um, which is very apparent that I started hearing coaches talking to young athletes and about how much blue light was so bad for you. And it's on your tech and it will disturb your sleep. So we need to get you off your tech earlier because the blue light coming off the tech is going to be disturb your sleep. Now, we haven't even had the conversation of how amazing blue light is. <laughs> so it's kind of like suddenly we jump to blue light creates serotonin. Blue light's coming off a device. We need to get them off their device because they're overloading on tech. So we'll use the blue light and the fact it's producing serotonin in your brain when you're trying to go to sleep, and we'll make it sound dangerous. We haven't even started the conversation of how amazing blue light is to us as human beings. So 
snoozing, snoozers for losers, napping, you know, just we just jumped to made it a bad thing when actually we didn't go on the journey of shifting from, you know, polyphasic sleeping to monophasic sleeping. We just didn't do it with any great deal of thought. And that's why it got such a bad name. But you see, you see an athlete in the middle of a, an athletics track waiting to do a hammer throw or a run a hundred meter final or where it is. There they are, just sat there creating some mind space moment, which you know all about from a psychology perspective, wherever you put it, is just creating that space to allow you to, rather than being, you know, physically active or or worrying, you're just trying to create that recovery. And as soon as you, you know, that's really been, you know, my success, I suppose, is I was able to find a way for somebody to see that doing nothing wasn't nothing. It wasn't a waste of time. It's actually you were able to, if you shift it, to being the first health pillar because it takes up 30 up percent of our 24 hours, you know, eight hours out of 24, these sort of numbers. It takes up more than training, eating, drinking, brushing your teeth. You know, it takes up a massive chunk. So it should be the first health pillar. Change your perception of it and call it human recovery, right? Then you start thinking about how I can recover and optimize that as a human being. Then you start to put other things in place. And suddenly, you know, as people would say, it's it's sort of game changing or it's completely changed my life is because what's revealed is their mood, their motivation, um, how they deal with positives and negatives, the impact. Don't go jumping into the positives so quickly. And don't let the negatives impact on you so much because they've got a recovery process in place that keeps everything a little bit more synchronized, a little bit more balanced. So they become more productive. Their diets start to create more benefits because they're recovering properly. So their brain and bodily functions, because they're recovered properly, can take full advantage of their diets and their plans and their training programs. And keep it more consistent and sustainable so there's less injuries there's less problem they get less worried and so strangely enough you become a different person i'm not saying a completely different person but when you take somebody from that that world of just randomness and sleeps on the end of the other pillars and they just it's almost like you can reveal that they're in they've, they've been in a shadow Okay? That's their peak. They're really successful. They're doing really well, but they're in a shadow. And if you just shift it round, suddenly they become more colourful and they become, they never experienced that they could almost do less, but actually perform much better, more consistently. And also, I think what we touched on before, David, was the last thing any athlete wants of me is to waste valuable time sleeping without benefits. What's the point? You know, when you go to sleep, you're doing nothing. You're not physical, you're not mental, you're not doing anything, your brains took over. So why would you allocate so much time to something that's not, you know, recharging the batteries, recharging your device? What's the point in plugging it in if it doesn't recharge your device? You know what I mean? So they kind of, once they get that mindset, it becomes... A sort of paradigm shifter, you know, it, it really shakes things up. And I love it. You know, like I said, I, I wish I'd known about it when I had my kids, naught to four or naught to seven, because they they come into the world in a polyphasic sleep. They sleep for a period, then you look after them, they go back into it. And as they continue to grow through those forms, that your brain is shifting the amount of hours that they need to be in a full-on sleep state. You can know what deep sleep is, don't you, David? When your child is in a cot and it's gone and you can walk around that bedroom and they're out. And even when they get, you know, one and seven, yeah, even when they start getting a little bit, you know when they're in deep sleep because you can play with their hair and play music and do what you like because they're gone right down into that semi-paralyzed state. So your brain is actually shifting you from a polyphasic sleeping pattern 
into you shouldn't change it. It's only the parents who went monophasic, who were trying to get the kids into a monophasic approach as quickly as possible, not for the benefit of the children, for the benefit of the parents to get back to some sort of normality of focusing all their recovery at night and try to get the kids to think like that. So I think if you had a another go at it and you you knew about this, maybe you did before your first child was born, then those nine months into it would be a breeze because you've got a polyphasic sleeping technique, you're doing little CRPs, you've got little vitamins, you're doing all this sort of stuff. The kid comes along and you just slot in like you did with cat naps. You just slot in, bang, 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 follow them through their journey and then make sure that they go into their lives not trying to be completely driven by monophasic sleeping. Then the people they meet, their studying, uh, their relationships, everything would be so much more invigorating, you know. And we could talk about that for a long time, but we do hear it, don't we? We don't get myself. the kids out into the woods, get them out by the rivers, get them out there, and suddenly they become. We all become aligned with those circadian rhythms. We get a really nice balance of serotonin, melatonin because of the light, dark temperature shift and exposure to that. We seem to find a much better place that it's it's not that bad. Mm. You know, life's life's a bit crap, yes, but it's not that bad because suddenly we create that recovery rhythm through being outside. So the more you can grab hold of that and bring it into your world, in the inside world, and really try to think about that within your environments, about your light, dark, and temperature exposure to all little things about, you know, if anybody wants to say to David, you know, what are you doing? Well, I'm just sat on a chair and I'm having 20 minutes. Are you napping? No, I'm having a controlled recovery period because later on I'm going to smash it. Mm. and I'm going to be as successful tomorrow. It's part of my plan. So whenever you hear people talking about training programs or diets, you know, which you can talk about endlessly, they're really quite specific of why they do something, when they do something, and what they're trying to achieve from it. Right? Really specific, whether you're going for a marathon or a triathlon or just a 30-minute walk with a dog, or you're trying to shift from no a day to five a day. Wherever your shift is, you really have quite a specific target of what you're trying to do. So having a controlled recovery period as part of your human recovery program to make you the best person you could ever be and live as long as you can and be as effective as you can, then that kind of, why wouldn't you be doing that? Mm. Yeah, I'm loving this conversation there, Matt. I know it's going to have to come to an end very soon. Can I just ask you one question, though? Uh-huh. What, what would your message be to, to parents who... That, you know, the children are, what, they're, they're doing 30 plus hours worth of education. They've got homework on top mm. and then doing 20 plus hours in a like a football academy or a gymnastics academy. So they're, yeah. they're performing an awful lot. What would your message be to, to those parents? David, uh, it's not how long have you got, but um, there is some very simple, practical answers to that question. It, it's difficult to pull it across in a, in a few seconds. I think the first thing would be to read my book, right? I don't say that to sell books, but if you're a parent out there, there's loads of books about parenting, endless, right? Um, But that little one could give you a few indications. One is when everybody's telling you to get your kids outside, you know, playtime, be outside, get them away from the tech and all that, really get your awareness up of circadian rhythms so you know what's happening while they're outside right and why their mood will shift because of serotonin production because of daylight and blue light so it's not just about get outside away from the tech it's about trying to find that balance between inside and outside because there's an amazing thing going on outside and your kids will really benefit from it not just because they're outside away from their tech right it's because they're outside with the circadian rhythms of the day as they grow the next one is there is a genetic twist, which is called chronotypes. Tap it in your browser. I didn't make it up. It's owls and larks. There's a little genetic twist that if you've got two human beings outside all the time in our journey on this planet, as the sun rises, 
there is daylight. Inside of that is blue light. And what we have is a little pineal gland behind the eye receptors in our brain through our eyelids. And so as that sunrise appears, that triggers that gland to produce serotonin and tell the brain to unsuppress everything. It also creates a little clock to be triggered, which is the adrenal gland, adrenaline and the cortisol spike. So you get this like start to the day. And around 12 hours later from that kickstart, your brain would be wanting to shift into a melatonin world, which is sunrise, midday, sunset, round the fire, go to sleep, right? So it's an amazing anchor point right there. So being outside as well as inside is not just about shutting tech down. It's about, and your chronotype, you could answer this question if we had time. Um, Are you a morning chronotype, David? Are you somebody who literally just wakes up in the morning, the alarm's there simply for security uh, because you're not in control of your sleep, but you're hungry, you want to do some mental challenges, you you want to get on with your day, and you love the first two phases of the day. But as you get into the third phase, so early evening, you're really not enjoying that part. The night timer uh, doesn't want to start the day with sunrise and AMs. They drag themselves into the day because they live in an AM as world called sunrise. So AMers get away with it, right? PMers don't because they get that second wind because of melatonin, serotonin. They've got about a two-hour phase delay. It's a genetic twist. So they become a little bit more creative and proactive later in those phases, right? So you look at your two kids. Think about your brothers and your sisters. Think about your colleagues. Think about your partner, your wife. Think about your boss. Think about your client, and you can very quickly go, what's your chronotype, David? Well, I know I'm definitely a morning person. Right, so there you go. This wasn't science. We didn't fill in a form. You didn't have a tracker. It was like David's an AM, right? So you look at your kids to answer your question. Watch them grow. Watch them grow. Because one of them, they might be both PMers. Don't try and get them to do their homework right in the morning. Don't try to make them do things in the mornings, right? You have to live in a world, but you do have to understand that your kids need help. Me and David are morning chronotypes, so we're now going into school, primary school, right? So we have to be there for nine o'clock, quarter to nine. Now, me and David will be up. We'll be jumping out of bed, uniforms on, eating breakfast, And off we go, and we'll be lively as hell when we hit school. Now, if you've got a PMer, you will be dragging them out of bed. They will not be diving into breakfast, and they'll spend most of the morning at school in a semi-sort of graveyard slot state. So if you're aware of this as parents, it can have an enormous impact on how you manage their formative growth years and how you manage yourself around them. You can't change the world. Nobody's suggesting that. But if one of your children is quite clearly not reacting to the day like some another child, or you've got both the same or whatever, is what you can do is give them synthetic light to give them the opportunity to feel as good as we do because we've reacted to the start of our day, right? to get them into the world in a, in a better way and to protect them later on so that me and you would quite happily smash our homework. You know, when it starts getting late afternoon, we're just going to start struggling a bit, might need a bit of help. So what we do is we switch a lamp on and it bangs out 10,000 lux. It increases our serotonin level. So me and David can actually do the homework late afternoon, early evening, right? Well. You don't want to do that for your other child. They would like to do it at nine o'clock. So if you're shouting at your kids, get off your tech, you're still awake at 12 o'clock at night. Well, hang on a minute. If that's their natural chronotype to be more functional at that part of the day, why are you shouting at them to get to bed early? Because you're making it far more complicated because it's not just about children being stuck in one box. These are two human beings. 
These are human beings. And because you've got no education, because you've just followed the random approach, why are you doing that to your kids? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, as you say, everybody. You keep smiling. Is your partner a PMA? <laughs> He's not thankful, you know. <laughs> um, but no, as you say, everybody is individual. So you've obviously got to, yeah, you've got to think about it in that way. Can you just give three key takeaways for the listeners and about what we've spoken about? Well, there's no top five tips. There's no top ten tips. Uh, I think the basic thing is just start your little journey. So. There are seven KSRIs in my world uh, with the R90 technique that I apply, which has been generated over the years. So, and it's a little journey from one to seven. And the first three is just tap circadian rhythms in your browser and just get a better relationship on this, in, this amazing tool that's at the end of your fingertips. And it's free, no subscription. Don't even have to think about not joining the gym after three months. Just tap it in your browser and get used to it. Your chronotype, which we've just touched on, you can start to be more aware of it and everybody else around you because you might not be able to change everything, but you'll start to get a much better relationship of your rhythm to any 24 hours. Absolutely key. You can't just jump in with some isolated solution. And number three, which is the key one, sunrise, midday, sunset, four phases of the day. It's a rolling 24-hour process. So what you start with, which is key, is the anchor point to your day. We don't wake with the sun, sunrise because we live in a seasonal dependent uh, country. So you look at an anchor point to trigger this clock, right? And that is your most consistent wait time, your most consistent stuff. Me and you would probably pick 5, 5.30, 6 o'clock, 6.30, 7 o'clock. If we took in 8 o'clock, that's like midday to us. A PM is the other way around. So pick your most consistent anchor point, right? Mine is 6.30. And then chop your day up into 90-minute cycles very quickly. That's how you measure phases of sleep in a clinical world, right? The stages you go through in cycles. Five 90-minute cycles is 7.5 hours. There's your eight, 15 in, 15 out. Chop your day up. In my case, from 6.30, my anchor point is when I start my day. Not wake, start my day, right? That's when the alarm's on. And you will get 16 phases, right? 16 90-minute phases. What that then does is create this lovely, lovely picture in front of you. What are you doing in the first 90 minutes of your day between 6.30 and 8 o'clock, for example? You then understand that the 16th phase of your day, the 16th cycle, is between 5 and 6.30. That's your wake cycle. That's when you're going to wake up, start your day at 6.30 with the alarm on. Then you can look at that dial and go, well, five 90-minute cycles are between 11 and 6.30. Five 90-minute cycles. So the first cycle between 11 and 12.30. Then 12.30 into 2 a.m. is the second cycle, and the third cycle, and the fourth cycle, and the fifth cycle for a five-hour, for a five-cycle, eight-hour. Then you can then, because you've looked at the circadian rhythms, you then know that deep sleep is only revealed between 10 p.m. and 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. We're being specific with the times, but it's that phase, right? Into 12 and the other side. So in there, your brain starts looking. If it's prepared and you've looked after it from the point of view, it'll start looking for those deep sleep stages. When I can get in your room, 11 and 12.30, it'll look for it again between 12.30 and 2. But anybody who's got a tracker, which we touched on before, you will not see those trackers, whatever they are, rings, or in, they will not tell you that you've had any deep sleep yeah, between like 3 and 6.30 because those are the wake cycles. A lot of people who wake at two or three o'clock in the morning and feel wide awake and they can't get back to sleep, that's because that's just going back to your polyphasic, natural, multiphasic approach. So suddenly what changes is anchor point, 6.30, chopped it up. 16th cycle between five is wake cycle. Then that one is about light sleep running into that one. The two that's going to be the one where my brain can get this deep sleep, which is only 20%, is those two cycles there. So whatever I'm doing throughout my day, little CRPs, light in and out, da, 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 I'm bringing all that to it. So when I present myself to sleep at 11 o'clock, my brain takes over. It goes and grabs that deep sleep either in the first cycle or the second cycle. And if it does get some of that, I'm going to feel great. If it doesn't, 
it's probably because there was things I were doing on the route to that place that it's having to keep adapting and couldn't get it for me. And when you mention parents in the formative growth years with kids, you're not in control as parents until they get to a certain age when you try manipulating them to do other things. They are being completely controlled by that internal circadian rhythm, that process of going along through that whole thing. So their brain is looking for this thing and generating because it's about growth. It's about regenerate. It's about creating that human being. And then suddenly you start to think, well, that's how important sleep was for me to get from zero to adolescence and then adulthood. That's how important it was. It dominated that period of time. More than food, fuel and hydration, it completely dominated it with the brain keeping you down in those deep sleep states. So as you shift, you really start to, I mean, it's a big answer to your question, but it is circadian rhythms tapping in your browser. Understand and be more aware of your chronotype. Chop your day up into 90-minute cycles. Create these phases because then your focus will be totally on what on earth can I do from the point of wake, the anchor point, doesn't matter how well I've slept, what can I do through those each cycles to give my brain the best opportunity to go and look for that deep sleep in those first two cycles of my nocturnal sleep because that is the stuff that allows me to grow as a person to regenerate as a person, both mentally and physically. And if I can't do something to help that, it's a complete waste of time. (laughs) A nice way to finish that, isn't it? Um, Yeah, no, that was was brilliant. Yeah, a big big thank you for your your time and your your insights there. Whereabouts can the the listeners find you? Should they want to reach out to you? What, you want my address? (laughs) I only just... Um, uh, sportsleepcoach.com you know sportsleepcoach.com is is my little website there's lots of blogs and podcasts uh, like with yourself where people can get a good insight there's there's little very sort of easy first step accesses like my book uh, which you can get in most places and it's also audible it's a really simple quick 90 minute read that will kick you off there's a little audible course on the website um, you can contact me and ask me questions or the social media feeds. I'm, I'm not a, you know, I tend to, I tend to share content that's of value. Um, I'm not just posting stuff for likes and followers. Um, but that's, that's where you can go. Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, and all of that is available on my website, sportsleepcoach.com. Excellent. Well, all of those details will go in the show notes. And again, I, you know, Big thank you for your for your time and your, your insights. I'm off for a cat nap now. <laughs> so am I. <laughs> I didn't think it was possible to talk so much about sleep, yet we could have gone on for so much longer. It really, really was an enjoyable episode to record. And I hope that little taster there of Nick's work helps you. In the show notes, I've added a link to his book, Sleep, The Myth Behind Eight Hours, the power of naps and the new plan to recharge your body and mind. Feel free to look it up and give it a read. It really is worth your while. Also, you might want to let me know your thoughts on this episode. Has it actually made you question your approach to sleep? It certainly helped me see cat naps as a positive, which I haven't always done in the past. In the show notes, you're also going to find a link to the conversation with kids email list that I've got. Should you wish to join? and receive weekly tips that can really help you with conversations with your kids. You know, each week I give suggestions that bit by bit could play a small part in improving their mental strength and emotional flexibility. So feel free to sign up. And until next week. If you enjoyed this episode of the Demystifying Mental Toughness podcast with David Charlton, do check out my website, sport-excellence.co.uk and my online sports psychology resources. The Sport-Excellence website has essential resources for anyone looking to build their own mental toughness or the mental toughness of their athletes or teams, or if you want to achieve peak performance more often or optimal functioning. The Sport Excellence website has everything you need to keep moving forward and thrive. So go on, head over to sport-excellence.co.uk to find out more.